Daniel Villegas. First, we'll go to El Paso County to see Daniel Villegas, a man who was found to be innocent after 20 years in jail. We, the jury, find the defendant, Daniel Villegas, not guilty of... <laughs> His life in jail was nothing short of a nightmare. He felt closed off and claustrophobic from being left in a small prison for years on end. So much so that after he was freed, he still felt like his life was over. His prison experience was so intense that he wakes up at night knocking on walls because he still thinks he's locked up, and his distrust for others only grew, especially since his prison was called the burning hell. System like that, so when I first went in there, that guard told us, right, when we were, it was 15 of us, we were walking in, he stopped us and he told us, he was like, hey, you know what, when I opened up this door, he said, every one of you motherfuckers are going to get your dick. He said, half of y'all are going to get raped, and two or three of you motherfuckers, or he said, one or two are going to come out dead in the morning. So he in 1993, 16-year-old Daniel Villegas found himself arrested for a crime he maintained he did not commit. The shooting deaths of two teenagers, Robert England and Armando Lazzo, who were walking home from a party in El Paso. His arrest led to a turbulent journey through the criminal justice system, one filled with coercion, threats of the death penalty, and a disputed confession, all at the hands of Detective Alfonso Marquez. Villegas was a suspect because David Rangel, his cousin, had been forced to say that he was a murderer. Villegas's life took a dark turn when he was interrogated by Marquez, who allegedly used intimidation tactics to extract a confession, including the threat of capital punishment and physical harm. He had forced Villegas to confess, telling him if he didn't, he'd get the death penalty. Despite later retracting his confession, Villegas was convicted of capital murder in 1995, ultimately receiving a life sentence behind bars. Throughout his incarceration, Daniel Villegas steadfastly maintained his innocence, repeatedly appealing his conviction, yet the courts remained unmoved. It wasn't until 2013 that a glimmer of hope emerged when new evidence came to light, pointing toward an alternate suspect and raising doubts about the credibility of Marquez and other witnesses. This breakthrough led to the uh, overturning of Villegas's conviction by the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals, granting him a new trial. He was released on bond and placed under house arrest while awaiting retrial. However, his path to freedom was far from straightforward, as two mistrials occurred due to hung juries. It wasn't until 2018 that justice finally prevailed when Villegas was unanimously unanimously acquitted of all charges. His harrowing experience with the justice system led to a lawsuit against the city of El Paso and the police department, alleging violations of his civil rights and inflicting emotional distress. Mr. Villegas, you have been under many conditions uh, in this court. You are no longer under any conditions in this court. You have you are free to leave. Thank you. Good luck to you, sir. In 2020, he reached a significant settlement of $12.5 million, marking one of the largest settlements in Texas history for a wrongful conviction case, $12.5 million. Additionally, the state of Texas provided Villegas with $1.8 million in compensation for the years he wrongfully spent imprisoned. Now a free man, Daniel Villegas relishes his newfound liberty, cherishing moments with his wife, children, grandchildren, and friends. He has also become a fervent advocate for criminal justice reform and offers support to others who have experienced wrongful convictions, Devante Sanford. Next, we'll go all the way to Michigan for Devante Sanford's journey from wrongful imprisonment to freedom, a remarkable tale of resilience and the pursuit of justice. At just 15 years old, he found himself at the center of a horrifying ordeal, wrongfully convicted and sentenced for crimes he did not commit. In prison, all Devante Sanford could think about was all he had lost. He hadn't been to homecoming. He hadn't gone to prom. He didn't even learn how to drive. What kept Sanford sane was his weekly calls to his mom. So you in this cell, you know, um, 18 to, to 23 hours out of a day just in the cell. Like, what you expect to come out that cell when that door open? Like, what, what do you expect? Like, it's gonna be a monster that come out that cell. You know? To survive prison, he began to plot his escape, but not in the way you think. He began by tearing down his mental prison to escape his physical bars. I came up with um, like a nonprofit organization, um, different business plans and stuff like that. Um, to help out like juveniles and stuff like that. The story begins in 2007 with a quadruple murder on Detroit's east side. In the wake of this tragedy, Sanford's life took an unexpected and agonizing turn when he was arrested, standing outside his home in pajamas just blocks from the crime scene. He underwent two days of grueling interrogation without the presence of a parent or guardian, ultimately leading to a coerced confession. Faced with overwhelming pressure and inadequate legal representation, Sanford pleaded guilty and was subsequently sentenced to 37 to 90 
years in prison. However, just weeks later, a dramatic revelation unfolded. A professional hitman, Vincent Smothers, came forward, confessing to the very murders for which Sanford had been convicted. Smothers' confession was chillingly accurate, offering precise details about the killings. In contrast, Sanford's confession did not align with the evidence at the crime scene. This revelation marked the beginning of a monumental shift in Sanford's case. The University of Michigan's Innocence Clinic, along with the State Appellate Defender's Office and Northwestern Center on Wrongfully Convicted Youth, embarked on a relentless pursuit of truth. Their efforts led to an official order to reopen the investigation, ultimately resulting in Sanford's release in 2016. Sanford's path to justice was marred by a system that had failed him. His initial confession, extracted under duress, remained a haunting chapter in his life. Yet, with the unwavering determination of those who believed in his innocence, the darkness began to recede. Wayne County Circuit Court Judge Brian Sullivan, in an act of profound significance, ordered Sanford's release and vacated his convictions. His release heralded a long-awaited reunion with his family outside the courtroom's confines. Now a 23-year-old, he was finally able to savor the taste of freedom, leaving behind the walls that had confined him. In a momentous development, the city of Detroit reached a $7.5 million settlement with Sanford, acknowledging its role in his wrongful conviction and lengthy imprisonment. I know what I want to do in my life. You know, I know where I want to go. I know what I got to do in order to get there. John Bunn. Next, we have the moving story of John Bunn. I'm an innocent man, Your Honor, and I have always been an innocent man, Your Honor. Born in 1976, John Bunn is an African-American man who faced a grave miscarriage of justice. In 1991, when he was just 14 years old, he became entangled in a murder case that would haunt him for nearly three decades. The interrogation was actually led by a rogue detective by the name of Louis Garcella, and he was threatening me, telling me that I was never coming home if I wouldn't tell him what he wanted to know. For Bunn, this was absolutely the worst day of his life. It was so surreal that it felt like a dream, but it didn't end there. He put me in a lineup with grown men. He made me sit down and hold a number up, and a couple minutes later, he came back and told me it was my lucky day that I got picked. I woke up the next day thinking it was a dream. That it was like I was gonna be home, that it wasn't real. When they sent him to prison, it was the scariest day of his life. He didn't know how to read or anything, so he started learning with dictionaries and books. By the time he was 17, he was sent to state prison after he got his GED. It was this reading that saved him. It changed his life and mentality, especially because at a point, he became very aggressive in prison. Bunn's formative years were spent in the Crown Heights neighborhood of Brooklyn, raised by his mother alongside his younger sister. The year 1991 held a fateful event. On August 14th, two Rikers Island corrections officers were brutal attacked and shot during a robbery within the Kingsborough housing project, with one officer tragically losing his life. The surviving officer, Robert Crossan, described the assailants, identifying them as two light-skinned black men in their 20s. Enter Louis N. Scarcella, an NYPD detective who later faced allegations of serially falsifying evidence. Based on an anonymous tip, Scarcella arrested 14-year-old John Bunn and 17-year-old Rosen Hargrave the following day. Astonishingly, neither teenager matched the physical description given by Crossan. It was Scarcella's lineup organized by his partner that led to Crossan identifying Bunn and Hargrave as the perpetrators. The consequences were swift. In November 1992, a jury convicted both teenagers of second-degree murder. Bunn received nine years to life sentence despite being paroled in 2006 for good behavior. Bunn's fight for justice persisted. In 2013, revelations of extensive misconduct by Detective Scarcella shook the foundations of multiple criminal cases, leading to a series of retrials motions. Justice Shondaya Simpson played a crucial role in this saga, vacating the conviction of Rosian Hargrave in April 2015 due to the false and misleading practices of Scarcella. Akin to a long-anticipated domino effect, Judge Simpson repeated this process for Bunn, ordering a retrial in November 2016. This came after highlighting the destruction of critical evidence, namely, the blood found outside the police car. The turning point arrived in April 2018 when an appeals court upheld Judge Simpson's ruling. The prosecution, conceding to the grievous injustice, dismissed charges against both Rosian Hargrave and John Bunn in May 2018. I want to say oh, thank you. I want to say thank you, Your Honor, because in 27 years, 
fighting for my life. Bunn filed a lawsuit against the city, seeking retribution for malicious prosecution, denial of due process, and civil rights conspiracy. In 2020, the city agreed to a settlement of $5.9 million. Despite his painful past, he founded the nonprofit A Voice for the Unheard to provide books and educational opportunities to incarcerated individuals. Robert Du Bois. Next, we go to Florida for the vindication of Robert Du Bois after 37 long years behind bars. His story is one of profound injustice and eventual redemption. Today's exoneration finally removes the shackles from Robert Dubois. Uh, he has the freedom that he's deserved all along. I want to apologize again to Robert on behalf of this office and the entire criminal justice system. Du Bois's years in prison were a harrowing one. He had to live each day with the knowledge that he didn't, couldn't fully live life. His family and loved ones are all far from him. Listen, man, I say whatever you do, Every time you leave home, tell your wife you love her. You know, I said it's very important. I said you don't know what today's going to bring, you don't want to know what tomorrow is going to bring. The prison sentence stripped him of fully enjoying the little things of life, so much so that now all he wants to do is take it all in, drink a cup of coffee, watch the moon, and take life as is. He's not bitter. He simply wants to get on with his life. In 1985, Robert Du Bois was wrongfully convicted of the rape and murder of 19-year-old Barbara Grahams. This conviction was primarily based on faulty forensic evidence and questionable jailhouse informant testimony. A bite mark on the victim's face, considered crucial evidence at the time, was used to link him to the crime. However, this so-called bite mark was later debunked by forensic experts. Additionally, a jailhouse informant claimed that Du Bois had confessed to the crime. This informant's testimony played a pivotal role in the case against Du Bois. Still, the informant's credibility came into question as he received significant benefits, including a reduced sentence for his testimony. Although the jury recommended a life sentence, the trial judge, Henry Lee Coe III, chose to override this recommendation and sentenced Du Bois to death. In 1988, the Florida Supreme Court overturned his death sentence, noting that the trial court should not have overruled the jury's recommendation. Du Bois was resentenced to life imprisonment. However, his nightmare continued. Years later, Du Bois's case was revisited thanks to the efforts of the Conviction Review Unit, CRU, at the Office of the State Attorney for the 13th Judicial Circuit in Tampa and the Innocence Project. Remarkably, unused rape kit samples were discovered in 2020, leading to DNA testing that conclusively excluded Du Bois as the perpetrator. In fact, the DNA evidence pointed to two other individuals appears that any sentence in this case uh, would be unjust, but just for the purpose, the practical purpose of getting him uh, out of prison today, which is the court's intent, I'm going to grant the motion. On August 27, 2020, Robert Du Bois walked out of prison as a free man. While he was not yet officially exonerated, his release was a pivotal moment in his journey to justice. Circuit Judge Christopher Nash agreed that there was no basis to support Du Bois' conviction, and his life sentence was reduced to time served. Du Bois expressed the bitter sweet feeling of his newfound freedom. He knows he can never regain the birthdays, holidays, and precious time he lost, but he's grateful to be free. Despite his wrongful incarceration for nearly four decades, Robert Du Bois was ineligible to receive compensation for the years he lost to wrongful imprisonment. This disqualification stems from prior convictions for minor offenses unrelated to the wrongful conviction, a law only the state of Florida had. However, in a heartening move, the Florida legislature approved a bill to provide Robert Du Bois with $1.85 million as a gesture of apology for the decades he spent wrongfully imprisoned. Do you ever think you'd see this day, Robert? Well, I just pray to God every day and hope for it. Joyce Watkins. Next, we go to Tennessee for, quite frankly, the inspiring story of Joyce Watkins. In a heartbreaking case that spanned over three decades, Joyce Watkins, a woman from Tennessee, found herself wrongfully convicted of the murder of her great niece, Brandy. Ms. Watkins, this charge against you is dismissed. Her life in prison was full of pain because, first of all, she didn't even believe she'd go to prison. But being wrongfully convicted took everything from here. It took everything away from us. It took us from our families. It took her from everything she worked for, but through prison, she had one thought, and that was to prove her innocence. Still, her wrongful conviction didn't allow her to grieve for her niece. I'm gonna go and visit her grave in a few months. But that's not all. It also stole the closure of attending any of her aunt, uncle, brother, or sister's funeral. The prison couldn't let her do that. I didn't get to attend any of my brother's or my sister's funeral. 
nor any of my aunt and uncles. This tragic ordeal began on a summer day in 1987 when Joyce and her then boyfriend, Charlie Dunn, went to pick up the four-year-old girl in Kentucky. Little did they know that this innocent act of family bonding would lead to a nightmare beyond imagination. The following morning, Brandy was unresponsive, prompting Watkins to rush her to Nashville Memorial Hospital. The devastating news soon followed. Brandy had suffered severe vaginal injuries and head trauma, and tragically, she passed away. Medical examiner Dr. Gretel Harlan attributed the injuries to the time spent with Joyce and Charlie, a mere nine hours. In a subsequent trial held in August 1988, both Joyce Watkins and Charlie Dunn were convicted of first-degree murder and aggravated rape and sentenced to life, sealing their fate behind bars for the next 27 years. Tragically, before their release, Charlie Dunn passed away while still incarcerated, never having the chance to witness the day their names would be cleared. It was Brandy's great aunt, Rose Williams, who initially had custody of the child, with her mother residing in Georgia at the time. Prior to Brandy being in Joyce and Charlie's care, the Kentucky Department of Social Services had conducted a visit to the home following an abuse report. Williams attributed Brandy's injuries to an incident on the playground, and the investigation was subsequently closed. However, after enduring years of wrongful imprisonment, Joyce Watkins refused to be silenced. In her pursuit of justice, she approached the Tennessee Innocence Project and the Davidson County District Attorney's Office. With unwavering determination, she pleaded her innocence, ultimately catching the attention of the project's senior legal counsel. We got this case because she, Joyce, came to us, shared Gitchner. She just showed up at the office and said, let me tell you my story. I need your help. Working tirelessly to uncover the truth, the Tennessee Innocence Project and the Davidson County District Attorney's Office joined forces to file a report on November 10th, 2021, requesting the vacation of both Joyce and Charlie's convictions. After a long and arduous journey, their efforts were rewarded when, on that fateful day, Joyce Watkins was finally exonerated. While Watkins may have regained her freedom, the scars of her ordeal run deep. It is a solemn reminder of the tremendous toll that wrongful imprisonment takes, not only on the innocent individuals incarcerated, but on their families as well. The 27 years she spent behind bars are a testament to her strength and resilience in the face of unimaginable challenges. As for compensation, the journey continues. While Joyce Watkins has been exonerated, she has yet to receive any form of official restitution for the years taken away from her unjustly. David Ranta. Next, we go to New York City for another exoneration caused by disgraced Detective Scarcell. David Ranta had his world shaken when a witness identified him as the criminal in a city wife hunt. This simple action cost him more than 22 years in prison. Mr. Ranta, to say that I'm sorry for what you have endured would be an understatement and grossly inadequate but I say it to you anyway. The prime of his life was spent in a six by nine cell in a Buffalo prison, so close to the world, but locked away. Every day, a reminder of a life he'll never have. According to Banta, he felt like he was continuously drowning, but the water never seemed to take him away. So much so that when he was released, he felt like he was still swimming, but unable to come to the shore. Right now, I feel like I'm underwater swimming, so I can't really just be honest with an answer because this is overwhelming. In the early morning hours of February 8, 1990, Chime Weinberger, a jewelry courier, embarked on a fateful journey from his apartment in Brooklyn. Carrying a valuable cargo bound for the Dominican Republic, he was tailed by an unknown man. When Weinberger saw his pursuer, he swiftly escaped in his car. However, the pursuer, a tall blonde man with a concealed face, drew a gun and shot Rabbi Chaskel Wurzberger, who was nearby warming up his car. The murder of Rabbi Wurzberger led to a citywide chase and a substantial substantial reward was offered for information. With over a hundred potential suspects, including Thomas Joseph Aston, who was identified through an anonymous call but died in a car crash, the investigation was a labyrinth of leads. In the months following the crime, Detective Louis Scarcella interviewed Dimitri Drickman, a convicted rapist, who pointed him towards Alan Bloom, a convicted robber and drug addict. Bloom was facing serious charges that could lead to a life sentence. After several discussions with Bloom, Detective Scarcella claimed that Bloom had confessed to attempting to rob Weinberg with David Ranta, an unemployed house painter with a criminal record. Drickman later also implicated Ranta in the crime, and Drickman's girlfriend supported their story. Bloom eventually testified against Ranta in exchange for immunity and a reduced sentence. Ranta was arrested in August 1990 and claimed to have been at the crime scene as a lookout in a station wagon. He mentioned that Bloom and Drickman exchanged a gun in the car. However, after he was placed in a lineup, the witness's identification was inconsistent, casting doubt on his involvement. The entire trial had a lot of 
inconsistencies. Nevertheless, in May 1991, David Ranta was convicted and sentenced to 37 and a half years to life in prison. Years later, an affidavit from Thomas Joseph Aston's wife indicated that her husband had confessed to killing Rabbi Wurzberger before his death. This revelation should have cast doubt on Ranta's conviction, but was not sufficient to overturn it. In 2011, the Kings County District Attorney established a conviction integrity unit to re-examine cases of potentially wrongfully convicted individuals. Ranta's case was brought to their attention. Upon reinvestigation, witnesses revealed that Detective Scarcella had pressured them during the lineup. Furthermore, it was discovered that Bloom and Drickman had received privileges in exchange for incriminating Ranta. Ranta's lawyer filed a motion to vacate the conviction, and the Brooklyn District Attorney did not oppose it. On March 21, 2013, after serving 23 years in prison, David Ranta was released. Based on the papers before this court and the record made here today, it's okay. The defendant's motion to vacate the judgment of conviction is granted. <laughs> He subsequently filed a wrongful conviction claim against the city of New York, which was settled for $6.4 million in 2014. Ranta also received $2 million in compensation from the New York Court of Claims, Sheldon Thomas. Next, Sheldon Thomas, a victim of a photo swap freed for crimes not only he didn't commit, but had absolutely no connection to. But despite it all, he had no bitterness in his heart. I forget him. Just like I made mistakes my, my life and People have forgiven me, and people have shown mercy on me. I will do the same. Sheldon Thomas, who recently emerged from a Brooklyn, New York courtroom after nearly two decades behind bars, still grapples with the surreal sensation of freedom. He spoke of his journey. I haven't even cried yet since I've been home. I haven't even got to the point where it actually hit me. I still have dreams about being in prison. I'm scared to go to sleep. As the days go by, it dawns on me a little bit more. This is all because his experience almost stripped him of his humanity. Behind the walls, you don't, you don't get that. You get the worst of mankind. They say the worst, do the worst, treat you the worst. And in a crazy way, sometimes you start to feel as if they're right. Imagine being innocent and locked up for so long that the feeling of freedom feels surreal. Being in prison where the only time he got out was during yard time, and if anyone got close to him, it was never a good thing. Now being around people feels different. However, Thomas doesn't want his years in prison to define him. I know I've lost 20 years already, but ultimately I prevailed. I don't like losing, so I have to let go because I don't want that to be what defines me. Thomas had been one of three alleged gang members accused of the Christmas Eve 2004 murder of teenager Anderson Bercy and the wounding of another individual. The critical error occurred when detectives used a photo of a different Sheldon Thomas instead of the correct one during an eyewitness identification. Detectives were supposed to use a photo from Thomas's prior gun arrest, but mistakenly pulled a photo from the police database of a different individual with the same name. This erroneous photo led to Thomas's arrest, along with two others who were not involved. The same eyewitness later identified Thomas in a police lineup, not realizing that the person in the lineup was different from the one in the photo. During a pretrial hearing in 2006, the detective on the case admitted to using the wrong photo, but argued there was still probable cause due to anonymous tips and a resemblance. Consequently, Thomas was found guilty of numerous charges, including second-degree murder, attempted murder, and weapons offenses. He was sentenced to 25 years to life. Despite proclaiming his innocence before sentence, he was unjustly incarcerated for nearly two decades. For years, various appeals had been fruitless. However, the unit that reviewed Thomas's case ultimately concluded that he was denied due process at every stage. To add to the complexity, prosecutors discovered that one of the detectives involved had a history of harassing Thomas after a prior arrest and lied about knowing him. When asked if he ever felt targeted, Thomas responded, most definitely. He noted that people who resemble him often face the presumption of guilt until proven innocent. In a heart-wrenching twist. At 35, after 18 years in prison, he finally tasted freedom. Mr. Thomas' motion to vacate the statute of conviction is granted. In September of 2023, Thomas filed a claim for state compensation. Fingers crossed for him that something good comes out of his pain. Deborah Mike. Next, we go down to Maricopa County for the incredible journey of Deborah Milky, who was wrongfully sentenced to death row for her son's murder. Luckily, she's now a free woman. Yes. Yeah. Do you think the state would ever come to Deborah? 
Despite being put on death row somehow, she knew that the day of her freedom would come. Still, it wasn't easy. In one breath, she was told her son was dead, and in the next, she was arrested. One minute, I'm free, and I'm dealing with um, a missing child and trying to get help from the police. And then the next minute, I'm in custody for the next 25 years. So for 25 years, she was on death row in solitary confinement for something she didn't do. At some point, she lost track of time. It just became one continuous flow. You know, sometimes when I think back, I think, wow, I survived that. But at some point, and I don't know when, one day it just all melted into the other. I don't know, I mean, the years went by, but it was like one continuous flow for me. For context, she was in an eight by 12 cell with no contact visits with anyone, including family, but she still sustained her fight and believed in herself. Back in 1989, a tragic event shook Arizona to its core. Deborah's four-year-old son, Christopher, was lured away under the pretense of meeting Santa Claus at the mall. Instead, he was ruthlessly taken to the desert and shot three times in the back of his head. The mastermind behind this heinous crime was believed to be Deborah Milka, his own mother. Accompanying her were two individuals, one of her roommates, an infatuated suitor and his acquaintance. These two men were later found guilty of carrying out the murder. Immersed in a whirlwind of accusations, Deborah steadfastly maintained her innocence throughout her ordeal. However, the justice system seemed to have other plans, condemning her to a sentence of death. For an agonizingly long 25 years, Deborah Milk endured the harsh reality of life behind bars. Every day, she grappled with the suffocating uncertainty of her future and the indescribable loss of her beloved Christopher. But hope flickered when a glimmer of truth pierced through the dark in a remarkable turn of events, a U.S. appeals court declared her conviction wrongful. The very detective who claimed that Deborah had confessed to the murder lacked any recorded evidence of her alleged confession. Moreover, no witnesses were present during this supposed admission. It was also revealed that the detective had a tarnished history of misconduct and dishonesty. Finally, the truth prevailed, and Deborah Milk was set free in 2013. It was a profound moment, but the impact of her wrongful imprisonment had left its mark. In an interview, Deborah shared her ongoing struggle to come to terms with her newfound freedom. My son's gone, my mother's gone, and so I just asked the question, now what? So I really don't know. I don't know. All I can do is take one day at a time. Her heart ached as she reflected on the life her son could have had if he had lived to see the age of 37. The sight of young men his age served as an excruciating reminder of what should have been. Every single day, Christopher's memory haunted her thoughts, an everlasting connection to a precious soul she tragically lost. For Mike, this is not happiness. She later filed a lawsuit against the city of Phoenix, seeking justice for the years of wrongful imprisonment she endured. But fate had other plans. A federal judge dismissed her lawsuit, attributing the rule to the alleged destruction or concealment of thousands of crucial documents that supported her claims. She got absolutely no compensation. 